I've been going through a series of sermons in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, looking at various prophecies. And of course, everybody is interested in that because, you know, we're living in the end time. In fact, some of us have thought we were living in the end time 50 years ago. In a sense, we were. And now we're just 50 years closer <laughs> to the end of this age. I have mentioned how I've always been the one to caution people not to jump to various conclusions uh, and get worried about pronouncements by one or other church or one or other supposed prophet or one or other evangelist or whoever kind of proclaiming that oh, this or that or the other thing is going to happen tomorrow or this year because the world should have ended last year I thought is what I heard because it didn't and the reason why people grasp at all those things is because they don't really just take the Bible for what it says and not deviate from that and just look at things very logically and then take a map and look at the world and say, where are these countries? What is God talking about when he says this, that, or the other thing? Where is he focused? How many Christians have in their mind where Israel is? And, okay, where is Syria in relation to Israel? Where is Iraq? Where is Iran? Where is Saudi Arabia? Where are these places? I play games with my grandchildren. Anytime something comes over the news mentioning some country, I ask them where that country is. And it's amazing that they're beginning to figure out where these countries are. Because we always have a map and we have a globe. With our children, we had the globe with the earth on it. And anytime we mention the country, we'd bring this to the supper table and they'd spin around and find the country we're talking about. At least we have some idea of what is going on. Today I want to talk about Russia in prophecy. For maybe 30 years, I thought I knew exactly what the Bible said about Russia in prophecy. Because I was ta taught certain things. And I was not in a position or I didn't, didn't occur to me or whatever to check whether all those things were correct. Like I mentioned here and in other places where for years some of those in the Church of God, including me, looked at Europe and we saw six nations in Europe and we wondered when would those six nations become ten. Because surely once they became ten, that would form the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's image and the ten kings in the book of Revelation that it will have power one hour with the beast and then the end will come. And it wasn't until there were 26 nations united in Europe that I was sitting thinking, and I do a lot of thinking, <laughs> and I thought, where was I wrong? Or where were we wrong? Now you got 26 nations. Now, of course, there are 28. And maybe more during this year. 
where were we wrong in saying ten nations or groups of nations? And as soon as I said it, I knew the answer. Because the answer is so simple. The Bible doesn't say ten nations or groups of nations. The Bible says ten kings. So I don't look at nations anymore. I'm just waiting. And when ten kings appear on the scene, and there's a lot of royal families that they can come from or wherever, when they appear, then I'll be able to just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And if I'm not here, maybe somebody who hears this or reads what I've written will be able to look out there, like my children or my grandchildren. They'll be able to look out there and say, hey, the Bible was correct. Ten kings. I don't have to worry about it today. But that is what the Bible says. And I thought that I had figured out and learned where Russia is mentioned in prophecy. And like most all people who write on prophecy, if you type the internet and you say Russia in prophecy, you'll have articles spring up at you. And they all virtually say exactly the same thing. Russia is Gog and Magog that you find in Ezekiel 38. That's what I believed for many years. Until, I think, 1987. I was reading a book. Mikhail Gorbachev, you may have heard of him. Mikhail Gorbachev was the Nobel Prize winning leader of Russia. Uh, he was the one that was being addressed by the late President uh, Ronald Reagan when Ronald Reagan was giving a speech in Berlin. And of course, they made a big fanfare about it. Here was the Berlin Wall still going through the middle of Berlin. And I could visualize where all this was because I'd been there before. And uh, President Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It was great. It was great politics because Gorbachev already had the intention of removing not only that wall, but the entire Iron Curtain that ran from the Baltic in the north all the way down south and divided Europe in two. So I was re reading this book on perestroika, which means restructuring or and his ideas for Europe, which were interesting are interesting. And then I got to page 191. Heritage and history. He's going back through the history of Russia. And I guess we should assume that he knows something about it, being the leader of Russia and being a very educated man who is still lecturing and writing. He says, some in the West are trying to exclude the Soviet Union from Europe. Now and then, and if inadvertently, they equate Europe with Western Europe. And I thought, yeah, that's right, because basically we used to do that, just look at Western Europe. Such ploys, however, cannot change the geographic and historical realities. Russia's trade, cultural, and political links with other European nations and states have deep roots in history. And here is the short little sentence which caused me to sit up and say, wait a bit. We are Europeans. And I thought, wait, no, no, that's not how I see it. 
Old Russia was united with Europe by Christianity and the millennium of its uh, re arrival in the land of our ancestors will be marked next year. Christianity, at that point in time, had been in Russia for a thousand years. The history of Russia is an organic part of the great European history. The Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Moldavians, Lithuanians, Let's, Estonians, Karls and other people of our country have all made a sizable contribution to the development of European civilization, so they rightly regard so they rightly regard themselves as its lawful inheritors. Are the Russians Europeans? Is the leader of Russia at that time saying yes? As soon as I read that, I thought, wait a bit. I should have known that. I read profusely. That's all I do, read, write. I thought of the book written by Boris Pasternak, for which he got a Nobel Prize in literature. You may have seen the movie, Dr. Shivago. I have read twice the mammoth book, War and Peace by Tolstoy. Maybe some of you have read them. What kind of people do we find in those books? Orientals? No, Europeans. Europeans. Who else do we know that was over in Russia who was a European? Ever heard of Catherine the Great? She reigned over Russia, the longest of any uh, royal over there, Catherine the Great. She came from Prussia, that's now part of Germany. What about the royal family of the Russians? They were killed by the communists back in 1917. These royals have a family name, like the royals in England are of the House of Windsor. Right? You may not have known that, but the House of Windsor rules in England. It was the House of R Romanov that ruled in uh, Russia. Who were the Romanovs? Nicholas II, the last Tsar, T-S-A-R, Tsar. Where do you think that, name, that title came from? Tsar. It came from Caesar. Just like in Germany, you have the title Kaiser. Where did that come from? From Caesar. See, these royal families see themselves as the continuation of what happened in Europe. Nicholas II, Tsar of Russia. He and his family were killed by the Russian Revolution. The Bolsheviks, they came in there and killed the royal family. Who was Tsar Nicholas? He was cousin to King George V of England. He was the great uncle of Queen Elizabeth of England. Now you can check that. You don't have to believe me. This will give you a nice, all you out here who like, who, who like to go out and study things, you can go out and study these things and check them up and find out wh whether I was just pulling it out of the air or whether I actually read it somewhere. 
I went to the computer and I typed in House of Windsor and House of Romanoff. And the computer gave me maybe 200 pictures where these two families were together, including when Princess Elizabeth was a little girl. I mean, Queen Elizabeth was then Princess Elizabeth. And I suddenly had to realize, wait a bit, when they killed that king in Russia, there would have been people in the royal family in England who were weeping for it because they were family. Gorbachev. Most of you have seen pictures of him. If you haven't, just look him up on the internet. Gorbachev, look at his face. Is he European or is he Oriental? <laughs> oh, I've got a picture of him. <laughs> there he is. Don't know if the camera will pick it up. He's a European. He was baptized as a Christian when he was a child. Isn't that fascinating? What about Mr. Putin? The ruler of Russia right now. Let's look at him and ask ourselves, are we looking at a, an Oriental? Of course not. We're looking at a European. I don't know why we didn't think of some of these things before. I look at myself and say, why, why didn't I think about that before? You know, we still have a lot of things to learn. I still have a lot of things to learn. And I keep learning. Let's go back to Gog and Magog. I'll do this very briefly in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, say unto him, Thus says the Lord, Da, 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 da. And you can read the rest of two chapters, 38 and 39. And people say, this is it, Gog and Magog. That is where Russia comes into the picture. And Russia will be joined with China. And they will all unite and come from the east. So we put Russia into that eastern bloc. And we never ask ourselves, now wait a bit, the biggest two armies that face each other on earth today is the army of Russia that faces the army of China on what is called the Sino-Soviet border. You see, the Russians are students of history they know that centuries ago the Mongolian hordes from the east, the Oriental people, came right across all of Middle East into Europe and took over and ruled Russia and ruled them fiercely. And Russians know that, that's their history. They know that the original settlements of people in Russia were the people from Eastern Europe and the Black Sea that moved in there, Slavic people, European people, white people. Years ago, South Africa was fighting a war 
up in Angola. Uh, the Angolans were being supplied by the Russians. And then the Russians had to send in troops to help the Angolans because the South African army was gaining the upper hand. The Russians could not send Russians in there because that would have been sending white people in there. <laughs> Imagine white people coming in and helping the Africans fight against other white people. So they used the Cubans. Sent the Cubans down there. So they, these Mongolian hordes came across the landscape, the great horsemen, people of history, and they subjugated Russia for a while. And some of the names of the cities you find in Russia come from that period. But then they were finally repulsed and pushed back out of Russia and the European peoples moved back into Russia. That's the history of Russia. You see, we didn't study that history too well. So here it talks about Gog and Magog. Who are they? Actually, the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 is a prophecy of a time after Jesus returns because they come against the Israelites who are lived who are living in unwalled villages they have no armies and these people come in to try to take the spoil as it says so Ezekiel 38 is a prophecy of, of a time after Jesus is already on earth if you want to read both those chapters it'll it's kind of self-explanatory. But let's go back and try to find who these people are. Let's go back to the tables of the, the table of the nations, which you will find in the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. That's what the word Genesis means. It means beginnings. Genesis 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah had three sons. God saved eight people in the ark. Why did he save eight people when only Noah was righteous? Some think that Shem was also righteous. I don't know how you prove that. But Noah was righteous, and then God saved him and his wife and his three sons and their wives. That's the story that we get out of the Bible. The Bible doesn't say who was white, who was black, who was yellow. It just mentions the people. However, from these three sons, we have the three basic races on earth. The Shemitic or Semitic, although Semitic tends to refer to Jews, it's used to only refer to the Jews. Shemitic, because they come from Shem. Hamitic, because they come from Ham. And Japhetic, because they come from Japheth. Okay, who's who? The white races are from Shem. The black races are from Ham. The oriental people are from Japheth. And basically nobody is disputes that. The only thing you can think about is how did the three races come through the flood? That's an interesting question. 
how could God have preserved the three races? You see, God's not against the races. He's the author of variety. So he wanted to keep that variety, not destroy half of them. How did God bring those three races through the flood? The only answer, the Bible doesn't give it to us, but the only answer you can come to is the three races must have come through the flood through the three different wives of the sons of Noah. Because obviously Mr. Noah was one race and his wife was one race, same race, otherwise it wouldn't work. Then the sons all would have been of that race, whatever that race was. And the whites will say he was white. I don't know what the Chinese people would say or the African people, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> then how do you get three races come through the flood? Through the three wives of the three sons. It's the only way it could have happened. So you have the Shemites, the Hamites, Hamitic, and Japheth, Japhetic. Now, look at verse 2. The sons of Japheth, Remember, Japheth, he's the father of the Oriental people. The sons of Japheth are Gomer, Magog, Madal, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. This clearly tells us that all those names put together, which is what we saw in Ezekiel 38, they are Oriental people. Can you by any stretch of the imagination say, therefore, the Russian people, including Nicholas II, who was cousin to King George V, including Gorbachev or Mr. Putin, say they are Oriental? <laughs> They're not. They're not. And Mr. Gorbachev said, we are Europeans. Here's our, he's got a whole book with evidence. He said, we've been Europeans for years, centuries. We've even been Christians. And today I speak here. And if you were watching the news this weekend, you would have seen that yesterday, the Pope was in Havana in Cuba meeting with Patriarch Kirill is his name. The Patriarch, the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. And the Russian Orthodox Church combined with the Greek Orthodox is the second biggest Christian church on earth. Now, let me pose a question. How do you think a Europe would unite without including the second biggest Christian church on earth? So all I'm doing is getting us to think. From now on, we should just look at Europe a little differently. Here's another interesting question. We saw the prophecies of the two legs of Nebuchadnezzar's in image. Those legs would continue for a long time. And we didn't always focus on that. I did think about it back in 1967 when I was standing in Berlin. And here this city was divided and in 64, I went through the Iron Curtain through to Hungary and Romania. And I traveled by train there and went through those double fences, mines all planted between those fences, big pillboxes with men with machine guns up there looking down on us as we went through the border. 
And I remember when we came back the other way, back to the west, as soon as the train went through that fence and came out the other side, everybody on the train just automatically applauded. And I said to myself, thank you, God, that we're back here. And that was the outline of prophecy given to us by God to Nebuchadnezzar, then to the prophet Daniel, that Europe would be divided for a period of time. Why was it divided since World War II? Because the Russians divided it. Why did they divide it? Because they were just greedy for territory? Well, some of them were greedy for territory. Stalin was a bad man. Very bad man. He killed millions of Ukrainians. He was a terrible man. But the reason why Russia did what they did was motivated by the same thing that will motivate them today, the fact that they lost over 20 million people in World War II. And when you talk to a Russian, that's the first thing he will tell you, or she. We lost over 20 million people, just like a Jew will tell you, we lost 6 million people in the Holocaust. These people lost 20 million. And they wanted to keep Germany divided because that's where the trouble came from. What did we actually end up with in the fulfillment of prophecy in those years? We ended up with the two legs of Nebuchadnezzar's statue continuing all the time. The one leg under domination from Russia. The other leg surviving because of the generosity of the United States. The Marshall Plan, the pouring money into Europe to rebuild Europe. In Berlin, they had a building there that looked like Uncle Sam's hat upside down. And when I was there, the Germans were telling me, that's Uncle Sam's hat. It's upside down because Uncle Sam is upside down and all the money is falling out of his pockets right into our country. <laughs> the Russians didn't want another war with the Germans. They suffered too much. Where are we today with Russia? That is very interesting. Somebody will be quick to say, yes, but didn't the Russians invade Georgia? Well, first of all, during Gorbachev's time and afterwards, all their satellite countries were all given their freedom. All the Stans, S-T-A-N-S, Stans, uh, Uzbekistan <laughs> and Kazakhstan, that tells you that's a Muslim country. So all those Muslim countries were given their freedom. Kazakhstan is still the place where the Russians send their rockets up into space and where the Americans who go with them or Europeans or Japanese, whoever else goes with them up to the uh, space station. That's all still fired from Kazakhstan. Stan, like Pakistan. Pakistan wasn't part of Russia but that shows you it's a Muslim country. So all those Muslim countries were given their freedom except for one, Chechnya. And if you look at the map, you'll see why they didn't let Chechnya go because if they did, it would kind of put a real gap in Russian defenses. 
So the Russians very selfish. They will make sure that, you know, we'll keep ourselves safe. They don't trust the Americans to keep them safe. They don't trust anybody to keep them safe. So their thinking is always protect Russia. So that's why Chechnya, although Muslim country, is still stuck in Russia and will stay stuck there. But then after that, Russia took over a couple of cities from Georgia. And we said, terrible, Russia's invading Georgia. I looked at that and I thought, that's interesting. They took a couple of cities, but they stopped. The Russia I used to know would have walked through Georgia so fast like back in 1956 when Hungary tried to rebel and the next day Russian tanks just went straight through Hungary back in the Hungarian Revolution. Didn't last very long. That's how Russia used to operate. Now we've got a Russia that says, oh, we'll take these two cities because they're Russian. And actually, in a sense, they're correct because those cities had a majority of Russian people living there. And they know that all those uh, borders <laughs> through the centuries have kind of moved this way and that way. You know, they're man-made, hand-drawn borders. So when I saw they took these cities, I thought that's bad until I thought about it. Wait a bit, what are they doing? Why aren't they running through Georgia? I realized, no, Putin just wants the Russian cities. And then, of course, he did a terrible thing. He went down and took the Crimea. And everybody was up in, armor, uh, up in arms. Russia took Crimea. If they knew history, they would have realized that Crimea used to belong to Russia. Until 1954, I think it was. And at that time, because so few people were living there, they gave Crimea to Ukraine during the time of Nikita Khrushchev and said, go and develop it. Why did they want it back now? Very simple. That's where Russia's got its naval base from where she could move through the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. The one thing you will see if you start learning a little bit about Russia, they don't do things for nothing. There's always a purpose. That's a good purpose. Their naval base on the Black Sea from which they can go to the Mediterranean and wherever else they need to go. Then they took some of the Ukrainian territory, the other part of Ukraine. Why did they do that? For the same reason they took the cities from Georgia. Because those cities had become majority Russian cities. And unfortunately, the new ruler of Ukraine, who was pro-West instead of the previous one that was pro-East, the new one said, nowhere in Ukraine will Russia be spoken. <laughs> That'd be like, like happened in Texas before Texas became a state of the union or a republic before that white people had come in here and they were living very nicely as Mexican citizens under Santa Ana. That's right. It was Mexican territory. And then Santa Ana made the worst mistake. You will speak Spanish and you'll go to our church. And the Texans said, over our dead bodies. <laughs> you know the story of the Alamo and San Jacinto and Mr. Houston, who conquered the Mexicans back in 1836.
every move on the part of Russia. Russia could have walked straight through Ukraine so fast. Do you think President Obama would have risked American troops to stop that? Do you think anybody in Europe would have done anything to stop that? If he wanted to march through Georgia, through Ukraine, Ukraine's not a member of NATO yet, so we don't have any obligation really to defend it. No. And the American government was more vocal than the European government. It's interesting. You see, Europe is right there, and most of its oil and gas comes through that area. That's where the pipelines come through. Why upset the apple cart? They're just taking the Russian cities. They're not taking the whole place. And as we watch Russia in the future, we'll see that. They're taking care of themselves. Why is Russia in Syria? Russia has just moved into Syria and started bombing ISIS. Is it because Russia doesn't like to see people suffer or hates ISIS? No, look at a map. Look at a map. And you will find that Russia has a big naval repair maintenance area on the coast of the Mediterranean in Syria. Why has Russia been backing this leader of Syria through all this turmoil? Because they don't want to lose that naval base. They don't want the Americans to come in there and take over that area. Look at a map. How does the Russian Navy operate? It goes from the Black Sea out the Bosporus, Dardanelles, that thin little canal almost going out into the Mediterranean. As soon as you get into the Mediterranean, just on your left is where that naval base in Syria is. That's why the Russians are there. It's the reason. And I'm not the only one that sees that. I mean, I've read that and seen newspaper articles about it. It's very simple. So what have we learned? What I have learned is that when I look at prophecy, I should not look at Europe without considering Russia. Which brings to my mind a very big, horrible realization, which I saw as soon as I read it back in 1987, that it immediately means that a united Europe with Russia backing it right now is in possession of half the nuclear weapons on Earth. We used to say, I wonder when Germany would start arming itself. And seemingly still hasn't started. Now you could say, well, how, how can a leader of a future Europe or whatever, somebody participating in a future Europe, come from Russia? Well, let's look at the leaders in the past. Where did they come from? Okay, I'll try to do it. You're looking at the map this way. The first one came from Constantinople, over there, which is part of Turkey today, Justinian. The next one was Charlemagne, Frankish kingdom, France. The next one was Otto the Great, Germany. The next one was Charles the Great, Czechoslovakia area. 
The next one was Napoleon over here. And the next one was, you'll say Germany, but it was an Austrian. Man who was born in Linz in Austria, been to his birthplace. Hitler came from Austria, then Germany. That's where these people came from. So to guess where the next one's going to come from, take a map and take a pen and take a dart and throw at it. <laughs> or maybe not. Let me tell you what scares me. And I don't scare easily. Who of you would have guessed that the leader of Germany right now would have been a lady that came out of East Berlin, East Germany? Remember when the two Germanys united? Amazing, miracle. Everybody thought it would destroy the German economy. It didn't. They joined together and somebody from East Germany, a woman from East Germany, ends up as the leader of Germany. Now, how many would have guessed that? It's surprising, isn't it? I keep thinking that I wish I could be in on meetings between Angela Merkel, leader of West Germany, I mean, leader of all of Germany, and Mr. Putin. Because you see, Mr. Putin for many years was in East Berlin. He was the KGB man in East Berlin. He speaks German fluently. You imagine the two of them when they discuss stuff. Like their brother and sister. Interesting, you see how dangerous the world has become. I don't know who the ten kings will be in Europe, except now I know what to look for. And I don't have to get worried about other stuff. I don't know who the final beast, that individual will be, that the kings will turn to. I dare say that if that happened today, say the crisis in the Middle East today was a hundred times worse than it is. And instead of thousands of refugees, you had millions. Whatever scenario you want to picture. If you were a European leader, who would you ask to help out? I think the answer is very easy. They've already decided to go down there and help out. The Russians, Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin, would you help us? Or do you think they're going to ask Mr. Obama? Or whoever the individual will be who will be the next president of the United States. No, we don't want to be involved there. I hope this gives you an idea of what, you know, there, there are things happening here. And what amazes me now, I've discussed some of these things with people in the churches of God. And some of my friends, we discuss these things. Other churches, as soon as I mentioned the ten kings, they said, no, 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 no it's ten nations. Uh, come on. It's going to be interesting to see over the next couple of weeks what articles come out in some of the church's literature, many churches, about the Pope going to Cuba and meeting with the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, first time in over a thousand years. You see, 
That's what I realized back in the 1980s. If you take a pen and draw a circle around all the Christian countries, then you know who in Europe you can look at. Then if you take another pen and you draw a circle around all the Muslim countries, kind of tells you the story. So next time maybe I'll talk about the Muslim countries because people know very little about Islam. The question I always have is, what is the thing that's going to trigger the next war? World War. Many years ago, two shots rang out from a revolver in a town that chances are you could not find on a map. The town of Sarajevo in what was then Yugoslavia. An assassin shot a leader and his wife. How many people would ever have thought that that act would lead to World War II? I mean, World War I. In 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. And nobody, as far as the rest of the world was concerned. A corporal in the army in World War I. Even Her Herbert Armstrong, who preached back there in those days, was looking at Mussolini in Italy, not Hitler, when he wrote, a world dictator about to appear. We don't have to speculate. Sit back, see Nebuchadnezzar's statue. We're down here, we're heading to the feet now. Just wait for it to happen. And some of us, me included, may not see it, but we need to talk about it so that our children and our grandchildren, because I will be very surprised if they don't see it. This world is getting to be a very bad place. Thanks for listening. <laughs>